Well, as most of you who have somehow dealt with Flow know that um, in its core it has some principles or supports some pr principles called domain-driven design. Well, and domain-driven design is basically about understanding the problem at hand. So you start uh, asking the right questions instead of uh, just thinking in technical terms and database rows and so on. But the question is, of course, how do you get, as a developer, for example, get that domain knowledge? Um, and there are different ways how you can do that. Uh, recently, there's, uh, there are techniques like event storming, for example. But un really understanding the domain requires um, asking questions. And one technique for that is domain storytelling. So the next talk by Henning Schwentner is about domain storytelling. Henning uh, is um, from Works Workplace Solutions, and he wrote a book about domain storytelling and is also the translator of Domain Driven Design Compact. So I'm very excited to watch this talk about domain storytelling by Henning Schwentner. Welcome everybody, welcome to my talk, Domain Storytelling here on the NeosCon. Um, I hope my clickers work now. Okay, yeah, welcome to this uh, talk. Good morning. Um, when you will see this talk, I think it will be morning. And since this session, session is about storytelling, I would like to start by telling you a little story. So, Get yourself comfortable and imagine a group of cavemen sitting around their fireplace, like you can see here outside. There's winter, the wind is howling, snow is falling, and it's a bit boring, of course. So one of the warriors stands up and tells the others a little story about how he hunted the mighty bison in the summertime that they are now eating and nourishing from in the wintertime. And after he has finished his story, there's a silence and the group hears a scratch and they turn their head and look onto the wall. And what they can see there is that one of the other warriors took a piece of coal and painted a picture of the story that they just heard. So we can still see this picture today, 20,000 years later, um, this earliest piece of art or one of the earliest pieces of art, of human art, um, a bison hunt. And now, 16,000 years later, still the same is true for us modern human, that we still like to spark a fire, tell a story and paint a picture. And that's what we're doing in domain storytelling as well. Of course, it looks a little bit different for us modern men. So there's no fireplace anymore. The fire is now a whiteboard that we're gathering around. And that story is told by our domain experts, by our users. And the painting is no longer painted on a cave wall, but it is painted on a canvas or a whiteboard. Like you can see here, my friend and colleague Stefan is doing a domain storytelling session. Stefan is not here today, so you have to get along with me. And who am I? My name is Henning Schwentner, and I work as a coder coach and consultant. So that means when I'm lucky, I get my hands on the keyboard. But as you all know, um, you make more money when you go to the right. So that's why I typically have today to do what I'm doing here with you. I stand before people and tell them what's right with software architecture. Oh what I think is right. And um, I'm doing trainings. I'm giving trainings. That's one thing that I do. And the other thing is that I work with teams um, working on their software architecture, which today means typically splitting up their monoliths. And the good thing about monoliths is you can build them in every programming language. So I see a lot of different technologies, which is great since I'm a technical person. And 
to be honest, you can build monoliths um, equally in every language. Well, one language is missing here that's especially well suited, and that's, of course, COBOL. And I work at a company that's called WPS or Workplace Solutions. We're the one with the touch table. And talking about stories, um, from the cave story to a real domain story, um, let's look into an example domain so I can show you what domain storytelling is really about. So let's imagine Bob. Bob is a victim of Dieselgate, and he wants to get rid of his old car and buy a new electrical car like you can see here. But Bob has one problem. There's no money in his pockets. He still goes to the car dealer and asks, do I get a car for this? And of course, he's in fear that the answer will be no way. You don't get a car for this. But car dealers, they are people with ideas. And so the car dealer says, no problem or Maybe that is a problem, but we got a solution for this problem. And this solution is called leasing. So you don't have to buy the car yourself. We are going to buy the car for you. And then we're going to lease it to you for a monthly rate. That is called leasing. So we do not just have the car manufacturer here and the end customer there, but we get a leasing company in the middle and this leasing company will buy the car and then rent the car for the monthly lease to our customer. So the leasing company does not have an interest in the car itself, just has the interest to lease this car to our customer. Let's look more closely into this story. Let's paint it on a canvas. So we have our Bob here, the customer, and this customer tells his wish for our car to a salesperson. And the salesperson then calculates the monthly installment for the contract. That's the monthly payment um, that the customer has to pay. And then the customer signs the contract for the salesperson. And now the salesperson passes on the contract to a so-called risk manager. And the risk manager then has to do a risk assessment. That means they check the credit rating. That is, they check the risk of the customer. And then they calculate the resale value. That is, they check the risk of the car. And based on these two risks, the risk of the customer, the credit rating, the risk of the resale, uh, of, of the car, um, the resale value, um, the risk manager votes the contract. To vote means the risk manager says, yes, the risk is low enough, we're going to do this contract, or no, the risk is too high, we can't do this business. Let's assume the risk is low enough and the risk manager votes positively, then the salesperson can give the car to the customer. So what we can see here, that is a so-called domain story. That is a picture or a diagram, something that's drawn, from a told story. That's what domain storytelling is about. We want to spark a fire, paint a picture, tell a story. So we bring together the right people, especially domain experts. They tell us their story, us developers. And while they are telling their story, we record this story graphically on the canvas, like you can see here. And the idea is that we can get rid of misunderstanding by doing this. Okay, so let's look more closely into that. What did we just do? What is domain storytelling explained? Domain storytelling is one member of a bigger family of methods. And this bigger family is called collaborative modeling. Collaborative modeling means we bring together, on the one hand, us, developers, and on the other hand, them, the domain experts the users, the people that are using the software and the people that are building the software. And these two groups of people, they should work together on the domain to understand. And what they have to do is knowledge crunching. That's how DDD, Domain Driven Design, calls it. Knowledge crunching means we chew on the domain knowledge until the juice gets out, the essence gets out. That's what we want to know about. And there are different methods in this family of collaborative modeling, user story mapping, something that you might have heard about, event storming, 
That's another method that you might have heard about. Those two are methods with sticky notes. And then there's one method that we're talking about today that's domain storytelling. That's with stick figures and arrows. And what all these methods have in common is that we're modeling collaboratively. And that means it's important to have the right people in the room. Who are the right people? Of course, when you can get Chuck Norris, he's always the right people. But usually, he just has to save the world. And so he won't have time for you. And then the right people are domain experts and developers. And talking about the domain experts, not any domain expert is right. We need those domain experts, those users who are really doing the work. Because we don't want to hear fairy tales. We want to hear what's really happening in the domain. So usually it's interesting what bosses say, how the work think they think is done, but we want real people from the trenches that are really doing the work because they understand what's really happening. And that's what we need to understand. And this is important for us because misunderstanding is so easily done, especially between domain experts and developers. So this is our domain expert here and he thinks well i get this beautiful flying horse and well yeah this is what he gets in real life down here and this is often happening in software development i don't have to tell you that you probably know that so collaborative modeling domain storytelling is also about expectations management we have to bring our expectations together what really is possible building with software and to build this common understanding, we just have a simple rule. The basic idea is pretty simple. We listen to the story, we hear sentences, sentences like the salesperson passes on the contract to the risk manager, and then we draw a picture of that. We draw a diagram. You hear the sentence, and you can see here, this is the drawn sentence. Salesperson hands over the contract to the risk manager. And since we draw this, our user, our domain expert, can see what we are drawing. And he can then say, well, this is wrong or this is right. In this example here, he would probably say, well, I'm not handing the contract over. What I'm doing is I pass on the contract. If you look here, what he said is the salesperson passes on the contract to the risk manager and not hand over. Maybe he says, well, hand over is also OK. Hand over and passes on is the same for me. And maybe he says, no, it has to be passed on because in this particular domain, pass on and hand over have a different meaning. And these differences in meaning, that's these small differences in meaning. That's what we want to know about. That's what we want to learn because we want to understand our domain because then we can build the right software for it, right? Okay, so what we're we doing is actively listening. Active listening means we are not just listening and nodding and say, yes, yes, yes. And then we split and he said red and I understood um, blue. But why we're listening, we're repeating what we understand. You can do this by rephrasing, by saying it again in your own words, or you can do it by drawing it. That's what we're doing in the main storytelling. We draw what we have understood. So we, we are mirroring our interview partner, what we have understood, what they have said. And what we listen to, what we let tell them are concrete stories. Storytelling, that's something that's deeply human, that's deeply rooted in every human being. It's telling stories, listening to stories. And the opening story we saw, that's something that even the cavemen did already. And all of us have heard, for example, this fairy tale here, like Hansel and Gretel um, sitting on the lap of our grandmother. So even children already enjoy telling stories and listening to stories. And we're using this here in the technique. So we let the domain experts tell their story. And what we're not doing is painting abstract processes, process modeling. That's something that also might be important later, but that's not something that's well suited for the communication between developers and domain experts because domain experts they are usually 
normal people, not developers. They have no formal education and formal methods, and they don't know what all these different signs here mean, that we have different cases and all this stuff. That's why we stick to stories, let them tell stories, and retell them, retell those stories by painting. And a story is not just made of one sentence, but of several sentences. So a domain story evolves and develops while it is told. So we start with sentence one here. The customer tells this wish for a car to the salesperson. And then we get to sentence two. The salesperson calculate the installment for the contract. So we have these small numbers here, so-called sequence numbers, and they bring time into the story. So we have time as a dimension here as well. And these pictures that we're painting, these diagrams that we're painting, they have a very basic so-called pictographic language. We have basically two kinds of icons and one kind of arrow. So what are the two kinds of icon? We have the actors, those are the stick figures, usually people that are doing something. And then we have the other kind of action, icon, the work object, the things the actors are working on. And then we have the one kind of, of arrow, the so-called activity. This expresses what the actor does with the work object. And then, of course, we have the sequence numbers. We've seen that earlier to express the time. So what are examples for these building blocks? We have the risk manager as an example for an actor. We have the contract as an example for a work object. And we have votes as an example for an activity. And we can form sentences of these basic elements. So the risk manager votes the contract, for example. What we can do now with these icons is that we can vary them. So we can use different icons for different actors. So we have a person here, or a group of people, or an IT system. All of them can be actors. Sometimes we put a hat on the head of a person, or we tie um, something about their neck, and whatever is suited in the domain that they are working on to express those people. And the same is, of course, true for the work objects. Now we also can use different icons for different work objects when it makes sense. For example, we have this installment here with a dollar sign or this car icon for the car. From my experience, it's um, a good idea to have different icons, but not too many different icons, so the language will not water down. So a handful or two handful of icons is usually enough for one domain story or for a couple of domain stories that are in the same domain. And of course, we will find the same icons again to show the same thing. Or sometimes it makes sense to not use an icon that represents the thing itself, but that represents the medium over it, which is communicated. For example, here, the, the contract is passed on a phone, the contract is signed on a piece of paper. So this pictographic language is pretty simple, of course. And I also want to point out what's not part of the pictographic language. And that is, we don't have cases here. We don't have if, else, switch, or in one domain story. And that is deliberately, that's by design. We do not want to have it in one domain story because we want one domain story to be simple and to be easily understandable as a whole. Also, when you think about it, stories are told from A to Z and not with, if this happens, then that. Example, when we think about Hansel and Gretel, it doesn't go like, if the sun is shining, Hansel and Gretel go into the forest and the witch is catching them. Or if the sun is not shining and it's raining, then they stay at home and the big bad wolf comes. Okay, this is not how stories are told. Stories tell one scenario, uh, tell one case. And that's what we're doing with domain stories as well. We say domain storytelling is a scenario-based method. 
That means we are usually not modeling only one domain story, but several stories to have these different cases, but also to go into different granularities. Maybe we have one big picture domain story and several more fine-grained domain stories to go deeper into one domain. Okay, so that's one thing that's maybe special about this method that we're scenario-based that we do not have different cases in one picture. Another thing that you might have noticed is that the actors appear only once and the work objects, they can appear several times. So we have the customer here and T appears in step four, fills out the contract, and in step five, signs the contract. The contract here is twice the work object, the customer is only once. And we do this for several reasons. One reason is we want the stories to develop around the actors. That's why we have the actors only once. Plus, we want um, the pictures not to be too cluttered. And if we had another arrow from the customer here to the contract, that would be hard. And probably we're doing different things with um, the contract and we are passing it on to another customer. And then there's many arrows and you can understand what's happening. And another thing is that we want to have boundaries. Okay, so now we can use domain storytelling on different media. The usual thing is painted on what we call a canvas. That is a big white um, place, like a big piece of paper or a flip chart or a whiteboard. There are also digital options there. We are going to look at them later. But if you start on a piece of paper, then you usually want to do something like this. Um, here, a great wide empty space where we can do the actual modeling. We put off the name of the domain story on top, and then we have on the right the possibility to note something, annotations, variations, preconditions, assumptions, that stuff that we may want to write there. And um, the background between these we want to be scenario-based is this here. Three good examples are better for the understanding of um, Okay. So what we're going to do now is roll our sleeves up. And Christian was so nice um, to be my interview uh, guest. And we are going to show you now in a real-world situation how modeling can be done. Okay, I'm going to switch to my to a browser window here, and I'm using um, a browser-based tool that's especially built for domain stories. Okay, this tool is called Egan.io. So Egan.io will lead you here. Okay, and then we need an example domain. And since I'm based in Hamburg and Christian is based in Dresden, we said, let's travel. Let's imagine I would have to travel next year in real life to the conference when the pandemic is over. And how would I travel with a train from Hamburg to Dresden? Okay, Christian, please. How would you do it? Sounds if good. I mean, first step would obviously be to check out possible routes between Hamburg and Dresden. So I would consult the uh, Deutsche Bahn website for possible connections. Okay. So you would look for connections. Um, and routes was, was another uh, another word that you were using there. Correct. Look. Looks up connections, and um, you said you are going to look it up. Who are you in this sense? What's your role name? I'm the traveler, I would say. The traveler. So the first thing is the traveler looks up the connections, and you said um, on the Deutsche Bahn website. As um, as a frequent Bahn traveler, I would probably do that first before considering other options. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, for the sake of the exercise, let's imagine um, you're not using the app or the website. Let's focus on the paper process. 
that often helps to understand building the, the, the project. I'm going to tell you later why that's a good idea. So let's imagine you're doing it the old fashioned way. Still, you're going to look up the connection and then what are you going to do then? Then I guess I have to go to a ticket office and buy a ticket. Okay, great. So you buy a ticket at a ticket office. So step two, the traveler buys, buys, sorry, ticket at the ticket office. Okay, and then? I guess then I uh, bought the train at the correct time, but uh, depends how much steps I, I want to take in between, right? Depends on the travel, I guess. Yeah, true, I agree. Um, so you board the train and, and maybe there's something happening in between. Yes. You said you're doing that um, at the right time. I'm going to note that here you can see this. This is a note um, as another element of the pictographic language. Okay, so you board the train and then? I, ho I hope the train is in uh, on time. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, I arrive at in Dresden at some point, I guess. And who's doing this? And who's um, starting the train? Or driving the train. Right, I guess the conductor, the train conductor. Okay. Well, then I, I'm going to model that as another actor. Sure. The conductor. Um, starts the train with the traveler inside. Okay, great. <laughs> ah, sorry. Yeah, but... <laughs> sure, you yeah. yeah, come on. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay so then the conductor starts to train with the traveler, and what's happening then? I guess I get off at the right stop. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the traveler gets off at the right stop. Is there a special name for that? Well, the uh, hmm. I guess as we as we model a specific connection between Hamburg and Dresden, I I would go with Dresden Main Station for now. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think when I think about that, probably right stop is better because um, yeah, that, that, that would um, that would work for other for other stories as well. Okay, but obviously cool. I would need to know when the right stop will happen. So I I don't know if if we want to introduce the train support personnel that. Tells me when the next stop happens and what the next stop is. Okay, maybe we can we can use it for the conductor. conductor doing that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I, I like that. So, um, um, the the conductor tells about this right stop, right? Yeah. Um, or maybe maybe it's he announces. Yeah, well, no, no, yeah, that's that's true. Yes. Um, the the next stop, and then the traveler gets off at the right stop. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. <coughs> oh, sorry. <coughs> so I hope it's is better. <coughs> okay. <coughs> so let's step this through. This again has a, a step mode. So the first step is the traveler looks up the connection. Then the traveler buys a ticket at the ticket office. And then the traveler boards the train at the right time and the conductor starts the train with the traveler. And then the traveler gets off the right stop and the conductor announces the next stop. Now there's something with the numbering, right? Yeah. 
Okay, sorry. Um, so uh, this should be another number. Um, I think that should be step five. Sounds good. And then it makes sense, right? Okay, and that's it. Or did we miss something? Um, for example, the, the ticket is that used ever again? Good point. Uh, I guess the conductor has to check the ticket at some point. So the conductor checks the ticket. Um, you said at some point, what what would be the right point? Between between starting the train and announcing the next stop, in our case, I guess, makes the makes yeah. most sense. Yeah. Okay. So that would be five, I guess. Five, and yeah. five six, and seven. Yeah. OK. okay. This now assumes that the same conductor is starting the train and checking the trick ticket. Yeah, which is obviously not the case. So there would probably be two people. So is this guy also called conductor? I don't think so, but I'm not sure what they are called. It's like the <laughs> okay, then let's train say... service, train service person, I guess. I, yeah. Okay, train service. I guess train service is fine. Okay, great. Okay, and then we have a process. And that's cool. Okay, so as I said, we should give this a name. So travel by train is the right word. And yeah, Christian, thanks a lot. That's That's nice. Um, that's a nice process that we built here. And what are we using that for now? So we traveled now not from Hamburg to Munich, but from Hamburg to Dresden. But still, um, we painted a picture. What are we doing with this picture next? And there are several things that we can do with it, obviously. For us as developers, as software developers, as programmers, um, the usual the uh, thing that we're going to do with this is we are going to design a program for that. And how can we use this for program design? And when we talk about domain stories and design, then domain-driven design is not far, or as we call it, hashtag DD design. And um, domain-driven design has this idea that we build the software in a way which is deeply rooted into the domain. So the idea is we build the software as a mirror of the domain. That means we take the work objects that we find in our domain and put them into the software. So we're building a model of the real world of the domain in the software. That's why we call it a domain model. Here you can see what a model is. Here we have, on the left hand, we have the real world. And here we have a model, something that's modeling the real world. And the model is always an abstraction, as we can see here. And how can we build this model with domain stories? How do we come from domain stories to code? Um, there's some basic rules. Um, the first rule is, we look at the central work objects, and from these work objects, we build classes when we're object-oriented. So we, for example, we found the contract here, it's customer signs contract, risk manager votes contract, and then we make a class out of this, out of this, um, we, we build a class contract. Or the same would be true for the travel example, uh, we would obviously have what I want to have a class, but with a name ticket. Okay, and the next thing, and that's maybe more interesting, is that we use the activities and we make methods out of them. So we're not only using the nouns, like contract, but we're also using the verbs, like sign and vote. 
And this way, we build a domain model, a model of the domain in code. And this is what we call a domain model with rich behavior, because we do not only have a, a nice contract, a nice class name contract, we also have nice method names, sign and vote, that express what's happening in the domain. And that's something really good. And we can do this in an object-oriented way here with classes and methods, but it's also possible to do this in a functional way, then it would be types and functions. But the idea is still the same. We still want to know the work objects and the activities. In DDD, we call this also an entity. And when we move on from here to code, then, of course, it would something like, look like this in Java. Okay, it would probably be better to have an example in PHP, right? Okay, so, and, and this is um, the, the UML class that we saw earlier. If we want to implement it in code, then it would probably look something like this. So we have a class here, contract, and, and we have methods, sign and vote. And yeah, this would, of course, work the same way in other languages as well. Okay. More or less, this is one of the basic ideas of object orientation. We take the objects of the real world and make objects out of them in the software. And we're not only taking the objects themselves, but also what's done to these objects, the actions. That's what later becomes the behavior in the software. So if you want to have a look more deeply into this, and one of them, do I see a real implementation of that? There's um, this small example, what, which I'm using in my, in my trainings. It's called Leasing Ninja. You will find it here at leasingninja.io, where I show this leasing domain and how we use domain storytelling and how we implement it in the end in different languages. There's an example in PHP, but I think it's a pretty early alpha version. So maybe you want to go with the Java version. So this is a basic um, overview um, about the main storytelling. I hope I got you um, a little more steps than you can see here, how to draw an all. Uh, two easy steps. Step one, uh, draw two circles. Step two, draw the rest of the demo all. I hope I got you um, uh, step 1A, 1B, 1C in between. But still, of course, um, it's not easy to do. So if you want to go more deeply into that, um, I know somebody who's doing consulting um, with this stuff. And if you want to know more about the main storytelling, um, I have to look on my watch. And I think um, we have... Um, two more minutes left to see one of the details there. So one thing that's interesting is there are there are different modes that you can use to make storytelling in. So there's a moderated mode. That's what Christian and I were doing. I was the moderator, and the moderator and we're asking questions, uh, like Stefan is doing here. And then there's also the co-op mode, the cooperative mode, which means. Um, um, everybody can ask questions, everybody else, and the people are working together and modeling together, like we can see here. Everybody is um, on the same eye level, they're building all this stuff. And there, um, here's another, another example, and this is uh, especially fun on a whiteboard. And when you're doing this co op mode, um, what usually um, it, it usually helps with that this is here not happening too much, that somebody's <laughs> inter uh, interrupted because um, this mobile rings or all this stuff. So if you have an experienced group of people that are used to um, the method, then it's usually more fun to do it in a co-op mode. On the other hand, moderated mode is also nice uh, for the right situation, especially if you have shy persons there, and it's good to have a moderator who asks not only um, the loud people, but also the people that are not so loud. And then, of course, there are different tools that you can use to make storytelling. We saw um, whiteboards and flip charts here. And we saw PowerPoint. That's what I showed you here. That's a medium. Well, that's not too well suited for um, a workshop situation. I, I wouldn't recommend PowerPoint there, of course. There, in a workshop situation, I like using a whiteboard. 
um, with sticky notes, because wipeout and sticky notes, then you can easily move things around, do refactorings easily. And if you don't have a whiteboard, um, a flip chart or some brown paper on the wall might also help. But um, here the arrows are more permanent and that's of course not as much as fun because you have to cross them up and so on. Digital whiteboards, they are also fun. Like this thing here, or this is the Microsoft Surface Hub. That's the most fun because it's 80 inch, um, very big um, and nice, but of course it's, it's also big and not easy to move around and pretty expensive. Um, another thing that I like is this here, um, a tablet with, um, with an, um, and a pencil. Yeah, that's something that's also working now in these pandemic times where you might want to draw it on a mirror board or something like that, a virtual whiteboard that everybody else who's not in the same room can also use. And then there's, of course, Egan, Egan IO, and that's the tool that I were using together with Christian. And Egan is um, open source. You can find it on GitHub, it's, uh, JavaScript stuff. Okay, how to move on from here? Um, I like to give you some further reading. Domainstorytelling.org, that's the website for the method if you want to go deeply, uh, more deep into it. And if you want to read something more comprehensive, then th this is the official book written by my colleague Stefan and me, The Main Storytelling. Um, it's published on LeanPub. You can buy it there for $15, but you don't have to buy it for $15. News come, um, attendees get it for $10 if you use this coupon code here. So, and now would be the time to take a screenshot of this QR code here or so. Okay, then I already talked about Leasing Ninja. If you want to see um, a real world example, then that's maybe something to look at. And yeah, the end is near with this. Um, usually, if we were not in the pandemic, I would offer you some swag for your laptop, but well, sorry about that, won't happen this time. I just say thank you and this is it. Well, thank you for introducing us to uh, domain storytelling. Uh, that was that was great, and I feel it could be a really useful tool in the toolbox of uh, Neos users as well. Um, we designed the framework in Neos based on domain-driven design principles way back, so we only had the very first, the, ori the original domain-driven design book uh, at hand. Uh, things have changed. We are also uh, feeling different about the approaches that we took back then, but obviously we still stand behind domain-driven design as a, as a tool and as a very helpful direction of going forward with software design. Um, ultimately, NEOS itself is a content management framework, I would call it. And in that regard, uh, many of our users don't, or I mean, many, but there's there's a couple that don't actually write software, but do websites mostly. Mm -hmm. Very specialized, very customized websites. Um, and I'm thinking, I think that this tool could also be used for that, to figure out, because websites are so tied in into customer processes these days that um, even even if you don't write the software behind the website, it can make sense to do such a process. Um, yeah. yeah, I agree. It, it, it also can be used um, totally independent from software or our website just for business process modeling or stuff like that. Yeah. I'm not used for that because I'm a programmer, <laughs> but um, I think there are um, many use cases for, for those stuff too, yeah. Yeah, that's great. Um, yes, thank you again. Um, I'm looking forward yeah. to, to maybe next year <laughs> and the swag in person then, we will see. Yeah. Uh, but this was this was a perfect introduction. Thank you, thank you a lot, and uh, thank you also for the for the uh, coupon. Okay, Frank, and, um, well, hopefully, see you next year. Yeah, thank you for being my interview guest, <laughs> and see you next year. 
Yeah, thank you, Henning, for this presentation, and also thank you to Christian for uh, moderating <laughs> this uh, talk at the end. Um, so, domain-driven design has been an important part for the NEOS project and has evolved, as, as Christian also said, throughout the years. Um, maybe uh, just as a um, reminder, I. I participated in, in one of the conferences, the Domain Driven Design Conference, uh, Domain Driven Europe, uh, co-organized by Matthias Verras, who also helped us um, uh, with the architecture of the NEAS uh, content repository. And it's so nice to, um, to experience these people because they are not talking about specific programming languages, they are talking about domains and problems and solutions and it's quite exciting be because people are not sitting there with their notebooks, actually literally <laughs> I think nobody had, had a notebook open there, they are more like uh, um, writing on sticky notes and, and on walls and, and all that. So fortunately um, we have Christian live here to answer further questions uh, because Henning couldn't make it uh, for this conference. So, hi Christian. Hi Robert. So, what's, what's your impression uh, about domain storytelling? Did you know that technique before or how do you put that into the toolboxes you already know? Yeah, no, I didn't know it beforehand. I had a look at it um, for the talk and I think I will have a further look at it um, even though there are a couple of tools that are similar um, I felt very reminded of how I conduct workshops with clients um, myself mm -hmm. and obviously having a defined toolbox that I can communicate to others with um, helps to make that process even nicer yeah. Did you do um, event storming as well? or how Is there a relation between both? Do you know? I didn't do much event storming so far, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't dare to compare them uh, too deeply, but I feel that the, um, that the outcome might be similar in a way, um, just that the event storming is more focused on the events part, where this is more on a process part, I would say, um, although I, get, I guess the same information can be gathered in both ways. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, I think it comes more naturally when you think about domain-driven design, how that can help you with designing big applications or also examples like you mentioned, uh, like car rental, leasing, whatever. But um, do you think that that's also suitable, as you also asked, uh, for, for regular websites? I mean, sometimes we, we might think like, well, that's just pages, you know, Where, where's the story? I, th I think a website actually needs to tell a story to the, the visitor side. Uh, it needs to convey whatever the student wants to convey to, to their customers. And in that way, um, thinking about stories, and especially today, many websites are not just static information transportation devices anymore, <laughs> but also uh, interaction devices in many ways. Yeah. Uh, thinking about the interactions um, is, is, I think, very important. Yeah, customer journey probably yeah, is, exactly. is one, one of the words you'd use there. Ex yeah, and dis despite it being called domain storytelling, it's, as I said, it's mostly about storytelling. Um, so I think it's, it's very well applicable in, in that regard. All right. What, what I would say from, from my experience with, with customer workshops, and that's probably, Christian, something that you can relate to. Uh, the interesting thing for me is, uh, in our projects, we, we uh, have a lot of different domains, so the abstract concept of a domain-specific language, we speak with a certain uh, customer um, to use their terminology, uh, is something that I'm very familiar with, and then I use the word, you know, okay, so let's speak in your domain language with the customer, and they look at me like, which language do you want me to speak? <laughs> <laughs> Have you made a similar experience in your workshops or do you introduce that uh, concept? Yeah, I, I actually tried mentioning it as a 
because it's it's kind of a technical concept. I feel uh, it's something I I keep on the on the development side rather just try to by listening to to clients um, figuring out what they call things. Um, so either I can just describe what I'm talking about or I just let them drive it and then get of what terms they use. Just try to apply those in the project instead of trying to explain them what a, a domain-specific language is and how they uh, how they should tell me the prediction for direct and all that. And from, from a technical perspective, I always uh, experience that as a it is a kind of translation f then for, for me at least. I yes. don't know how it is for you, Robert, but for me it's like, okay, there's a customer language and there's a technical language in the background and, and, and matching those two together and this concept of dom domain-driven design um, is, is a very useful tool um, to, to bridge that translation gap. Um, so I very much enjoy talks like this one from, from Henning and, and Christian um, of setting that mental stage um, to, to bridge that you know, distance mm. uh, between the developers um, and, and yeah, the customer. Also, also, I mean, often is the first time uh, when, when you're modeling these domains is the first time customers really think about their problem at all. So that's, that's definitely a useful technique to use. Well, thank you, That's Christian. That's absolutely for me. Oh, oh, yeah? Sorry. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. With with <laughs> Christian, I always need to ask him um, <laughs> something very specific. You have a wonderful background yeah. today again, Christian. Um, <laughs> yes, I would say you look uh, so sparkly. Uh, yeah, I do. Right. I mean, especially the background. Does it work in the awesome. stream? Yeah, I don't know. Sparkling, actually. Yeah, I think we can see it a little bit. So in in, in the preview. Um, with a flashlight. <laughs> Christian actually has a sparkly shoes background. That's so awesome. Thank <laughs> you very, very much for showing that to us, Christian. We need some sparkle in the NIRS <laughs> conference. <laughs> the color you bring to this, these conferences is, is so valuable. And uh, I love you specifically and <laughs> specifically for that, uh, for, for bringing that. Yeah, uh, the yeah. color, <laughs> the color you bring to our conferences. Um, Next year again, live, hopefully. We're all looking forward to a live conference. I think um, it's been what one and a half years since most of us met in person. Um, at least one and a half years. So um, thank you very much to Henning and Christian for for their talk today. Thanks for the opportunity to to have this conversation with you, Christian. Thank you. Yeah, super cool.